Hi and welcome to this self-teach module. I'm Dave Algio, your facilitator for this session. This module forms part of a package of a range of self-teach modules and some shorter bite-sized videos, along with some drop-in Q&A sessions where you can develop your learning by asking questions and interacting with each other. Those sessions will be posted in terms of dates and availability, and I think there's going to be options of both online and in person as we go forward. But in this session, what I want to do is discuss the topic that's part of, forms part of mediation and give you some tools and tactics around resolving conflict and disagreement constructively. And here's what to expect in this particular self-teach. We'll be providing some models, tools and tips, which I think is really practical and useful to help you take away and see how you can embed into your day-to-day -to -day working life. Uh, we want to provide you some reflective questions and that's really to get you thinking for 60 seconds or I may encourage you to pause the video um, and, and take a bit longer, but to reflect on how you would contextualise the knowledge and the tips and apply in your own life and your own student leadership role. It's really important that you do that because taking on knowledge is one part of it. However, we lose that knowledge pretty quickly if we don't start to think about applying it and mull it over, consider it and then apply it. And then you'll find some post-session resources and exercises afterwards, which is really useful for you to follow on the journey afterwards to support your embedding of the learning as we go forward. So what, how to use this self-teach module? Firstly, block out the time. Give yourself the space, the length of the video at the very least, but perhaps longer as well, to allow a chance for you to rewind, to pause, to reflect a bit longer. Block that time out and make it distraction free so that you can give it the quality time it deserves and you deserve in terms of learning and development. And then think about downloading the PDF workbook. There are some resources there. You may download that now or before or during the course or afterwards, but there are some resources in there that can be really useful for you to work on. And then complete the exercises. Key part to embedding the learning is actually reflecting, applying, thinking, writing down, discussing and, and then applying it in the real world. Pause and rewind, revisit at any time. You've got the luxury of doing that, so please do. If there's anything that you can't remember, you've got the option to go back. And then complete those post-session activities in particular to take that journey of what we talk about in these videos forward into uh, your student leadership life. And then we have the drop-in Q&A sessions planned. As I mentioned before, those dates haven't been posted at the time of recording, but hopefully they will be available. So if you feel that there are areas that you want to just dig a bit deeper, ask a few more questions, there will be somebody, possibly me, possibly somebody else who has a particular expertise uh, that can share that knowledge and kind of get into the weeds with you on, on particular questions. Okay, so we're going to cover in this module a number of things. We need to understand conflict. And that might sound like, well, it's obvious what it is, but let's just understand, appreciate it in the context of how we mediate and resolve conflict. So we need to understand that. We need to recognise the impact of emotions on conflict. And I'll explain, expand on that as we go. And then how do we manage emotionally volatile situations and interactions? That's critical because one of the challenges with mediation is that it can go awry because people get irate, because you or others or both get angry, upset, offended, threatened, that kind of thing. And I don't necessarily mean this physically threatened. That's not what the purpose of this module is about. It's about that communication based solely at the verbal level. And we're going to provide some conflict resolution tools as well. And then some general mediation tips just to help you along with that, how we apply this as we go forward. OK, so I guess the first question here is, is conflict always a bad thing? So. I think this is something just to acknowledge, because if we think about it, there are probably examples that we can think of when we think of conflict, of bad conflict. Arguments, fights, finger pointing, raised voices, conflict, you know, we're talking military conflicts, that kind of thing, you know, the, the, the big end of the scale. However, when we talk about conflict, at the basic level, we're talking about some sort of disagreement or a, a, a contravention disagreement in terms of opinions, of values, how we treat each other, that kind of thing. So we can look at this as a bit of a continuum and we can look at it at that destructive end where, and if we bring it back to yourself and your role interacting with others, that destructive end is when perhaps tempers are frayed, uh, fingers are pointed, voices are raised, raised, and we can get personal or it can become personal and directed personally at us. And we can experience that p sense of personal attack now, as I said, we're not dealing with aggression or violence in this particular video. Any situation, just a quick advice here, any situation where you're in that position is to protect safety first, because that's 
it, that's not what we're trying to skill you up on in this particular respect and it's not part or an expected part of your role. So personal attacks, we're talking about a verbal, perhaps sort of intimidating, feeling that kind of sense of, whoa, you're in my face type thing, but that can be really that destructive end of conflict. However, if we move down the scale, we do have an area that is constructive. How many times have you had a disagreement and during a, a sensible or a rational conversation, one or both of you, perhaps in this conversation, has changed your mind or come to a different perspective? Or as a team, that healthy interaction and debate leads to ideas, leads to new things, new ways of working and, and progress, motivation, enhanced relationships. And this is the key because constructive conflict is a healthy thing. And if we can have teams that feel able to interact in a way where we are safe to air our opinions and what have you, then it can be a really, really vibrant, valuable place to be. And if you wanted to delve into that, I am doing a self-teach that develops this idea of safe uncertainty, psychological safety, and how we can use that, this idea of developing that environment where we can disagree, we can interact, we can debate constructively. So that's an important area. However, we continue down the continuum and we find this area of artificial harmony where conflict is avoided, where we maybe just ignore interactions within the team where two people aren't getting on, or we try to just maintain a false harmony where we don't air grievances or disagreements. Now, this is important, particularly as a leader, because some of you may be more uncomfortable with managing disagreements, challenging, debating you may not feel comfortable in that area because either you lack the confidence or the skills or just bad experience has led you to feel like i'm just not great at this and i don't want to go there now as a, a, a leader what we need to recognize is that the challenge here is that the avoidance the artificial harmony is counterproductive and it means we miss out on the benefits of constructive disagreement but also we can lead to other unintended consequences like resentment if other members of our team are looking on and thinking, why haven't you challenged that? Why aren't you speaking up? We want to know what you think uh, and that kind of thing. That can be really, really challenging uh, to think about. So what I want to do is give you, you leave the video running and what I want you to do is consider the question. What are some of the causes of conflict becoming more volatile? So we've looked at destructive and we've looked at the constructive aspect of it. What are some of the causes that lead it from going constructive to destructive? What do you feel are some of those underlying things, the issues, the, the, the situations, the, the factors that play into that? So take 60 seconds out um, to do that, and I will start the clock now and it will count down. Grab a pen and paper, and then during the 60 seconds, just chuck your general thoughts down. If you want to pause the video and do a little bit longer, by all means do. But this is just an opportunity to get the topmost thoughts of thoughts at surface. Okay, so you may have identified a number of things. You may have identified that stress plays into it. You know, if you or another or individuals are stressed or it's a stressful environment or an event is at peak stress because of whatever's going on, lots of demands, that can play into nerves getting frayed, people getting impatient and perhaps people becoming more irate, irritable, agitated or even angry. Feeling unwell. 
<laughs> Let's be right, I'm sure there have been days when you're feeling under the weather or downright just unwell. It could, could be a hangover or it could be a cold or something a, a little bit more. But when we're feeling unwell, our coping reserves and resources are often directed in just trying to get through, trying to manage. And because of that, we can perhaps feel more irritable, less inclined to do the right thing or be patient and constructive with people. Tired. Again, if we're tired, if we haven't had a good night's sleep or we're exhausted, that again can lead to that. Somebody's angry. And angry could be caused by a lot of different reasons. But if you enter into a discussion or debate or disagreement or challenging somebody in a state where one of you or both of you are already angry, that has implications on how this will turn out. And we'll come back to that actually in due course. Not being listened to. Again, this is an important one because how often have you experienced that situation where you have something to say, but you feel as if you haven't been listened to, you've been dismissed, you've been talked over. And that's a really, I know from my own experience, but I'm sure from yourselves, that can be really, really disempowering, really upsetting. And it can have that impact of feeling like, well, what's the point? Or actually escalating our response in order to be heard, which is the way constructive uh, conflict can lead to that more uh, destructive aspect. And misunderstanding. We just haven't got, we're not on the right page. We're talking past each other. We might be saying the right same thing, actually, but we're just not getting what each other's saying. That misunderstanding can lead to, obviously, significant dis uh, destructive conflict as well. And feeling dismissed. Feeling as if you have just been overlooked or dismissed or just not heard. So that's that, a bit like they're not being listened to. Um, but even if somebody listens to you, but then they don't value what you say or don't appreciate and they don't appreciate what you've said behind the words, what you're trying to say, what the message is. It's really important to recognise some of these underlying causes are some of those factors. And as a leader, when we're communicating with somebody who may be in a state of stress or agitated, angry, there may well be underlying reasons that we need to factor in. Not excusing poor or bad behaviour, let's park that, that's something that we don't do. If we're feeling threatened, intimidated or bullied, um, then that's something we need to deal with in a different manner. However, we can still as a leader look at the underlying reasons and pain, if you like, for that. And intoxicated, you know, if, we're, if one member of your team or a, a, a customer, client or somebody is inebriated or under the influence of some sort of drugs, it makes them more unpredictable. It makes them less able to focus, concentrate and, and engage in a coherent conversation. Feeling belittled as well, you know, if we just downright talk to somebody in a in a patronising, belittled way, then that's obviously going to lead to perhaps a sense of the, the conflict, either moving back into artificial harmony, where somebody just says, what's the point, I'm not bother, I'll just pretend, I'll just say it's all right, or the, the, the destructive aspect of conflict. And to wrap this up, I think one of the things is to recognise, as I kind of indicated there, is that what we say or how we behave, and sometimes we may behave in a, a, a more agitated, angry way. And when I say we, I mean collective members, members of our team and ourselves, because we can be guilty of this too. Um, there is often a need unmet or a pain behind the words and the behaviour. We're not excusing bad behaviour, we're trying to understand the reasons behind. We may need to deal with the behaviour, but it's useful as a leader to understand. And that's why I like this quote by Marshall Rosenberg, who wrote the book Nonviolent Communication. Um, At the root of every tantrum and power struggle are needs unmet. And as a leader, there's real opportunities there to dig beneath, to try to say, to read between the lines effectively. What are they saying, but what is it really? And I think that's a real challenge to, to explore. There's some great opportunities and I am doing a session on listening skills as well, which can be useful as well in this respect. So what I'm suggesting really, particularly in the, in the area of resolving conflict constructively, trying to get to a place where we may not fully agree, but we agree to disagree and we have a working relationship going forward, is that we need to park into intellectual understanding until we have looked at and explored and aired any feelings and emotions that are perhaps underneath the surface. Because the feelings and the emotions will often cloud, will get in the way, will take over the intellectual aspect. 
So before you and others can start to get rational about how we're going to solve this, these are the facts. Do you understand this? This is what I'm trying to say. I get what you're saying. We need to deal with the emotions and help them dissipate, validate and acknowledge that. And that's different to the behaviour. If behaviour is bad, we don't validate behaviour. We deal with that. But in terms of the emotions, emotions are emotions. What we do with them is the key. So I want to come on to another conflict continuum um, and really explore the options that we have when we're talking about this whole area of mediation uh, and resolving conflict. And the key is, how do we resolve? So if we think about this, you know, we've talked about going from artificial harmony to constructive to destructive and personal attack. We also need to recognise, well, what approach am I is best taken at a given stage in in behaviour and in the conflict. So if we think at one end, we can just avoid conflict. So that is one option. I'll come back to that. We then at the other end have the option to resolve that conflict. So we have the, obviously the two. Ideally, we want to resolve conflict wherever possible. But is there a case for avoidance? I'll come back to that. And in the middle, somewhere in the middle, we may need to focus on diffusing. And this is where we talk about the the or bring in the emotional aspect of things because emotions are as we said get in the way of rational and the ability to resolve so if somebody if you and or others are in a place where tempers are high emotions are high upset tears anger then we need to focus on diffusing not resolving because it is very very difficult if not impossible to resolve something when we're in a heightened state of emotional uh, emotional displays if you like so those are those now what we have at the other end is we have two options when we get to resolve we have power option or we have negotiation now today for this session we're focusing on the negotiation primarily because well two reasons one I guess in terms of your role as student leader power is something that is is based on consent on willingness you know people around you are uh, uh, agreeing to go with what you say or a direction or what have you largely on request on willingness so power is something that you may not have a lot to exercise which in fact is actually a good thing because power can often lead to a, a win-lose in the short term but in my experience a lose-lose in the long term and what do I mean by that well I mean by kind of saying right okay look it's I'm in charge we'll just do this you two just knock it off and you make friends now in that immediate compliance, which you may get, debatable, you may get immediate compliance, win, perhaps lose on their point, but ultimately you get lose-lose because you get immediate compliance but unresolved issues that are there to continue to fester. So power is something that we, in my view, rarely need to go to or should go to. There may be one or two options, and in the, the self-teach module on conflict resolution, where I talk about how do you challenge inappropriate behaviour and performance, there may be aspects where we need to do that. But again, proportioned and measurable. But we'll come back to that in that other module. So negotiation is the actual ideal, if you like. And what we're seeking there is the win-win. We get to a point where all parties' experiences, opinions have been aired. We can come to some sort of discussion and debate and we can kind of meet in that middle ground. That's what we're talking about, the negotiation. So, another 60 second capture. Think of a situation where it might be appropriate for you to avoid dealing with conflict. I did kind of hint that there may be times. So when do you think it might be useful to avoid or the right thing to do? And also, when do you think it might be particularly useful to diffuse rather than resolve? I've already given a general idea, but think about a situation in your own uh, student leadership, like perhaps in your own life, where diffusing is the name of the game. So avoidance and diffusing. Give us an idea, jot some thoughts down, and again, I'll start the clock so that you can uh, take some thoughts. And again, if you want to pause the video, please do, but if not, take the 60 seconds now.
So hopefully you've got a few ideas. The key thing here is that in avoidance is something that is not generally the desired option for the vast majority of conflict. In fact, the sooner we air and discuss and deal and confront the conflict, the better in any given situation. However, let's assume in this case that you are in physical danger or there is some physical danger apparent because of some sort of interaction that's gone wrong. That is the time to avoid the conflict. And perhaps for you and maybe others to, to, um, who are involved to exit, to preserve and protect safety. We're not actually dealing, diffusing the conflict. It's just about safety. And again, there may be examples of that. Diffusing is where we just are not in a position to resolve because emotions are high, tempers are high, frayed, people are finger pointing, there is not an ability to get rational. So when we're in that place, it is, it's not advisable to even try to resolve. We just need to settle things down and diffuse things. And we'll look at how we can do that later. So how do we know? And I think this is a key part. How do you know what stage somebody is at emotionally in terms of whether we need to diffuse or we have the option to resolve. So let's look at the warning signs here for when we need to just be aware that perhaps diffusing the situation or even avoiding um, is the right thing to do. Now, when I say avoiding, I don't mean avoid forever because that's real avoidance and it means that we haven't addressed the underlying conflict. It may be to avoid for now or to diffuse for now and then at some point when tempers are lower and people are in a more rational place, we get on with resolution and negotiation. But let's look at a bit of a continuum to kind of illustrate that. So we think about it, we've got calm at the lower end. Um, calm, everybody's calm, rational, able to interact, you know, respectfully, etc. Then we might get that agitated and nervous experience where I'm sure you've all experienced that, where perhaps people are getting a little bit fidgety um, but I'm shuffling hands in pockets, out of pockets, folding arms, moving about a bit, maybe a bit of that moving around. My classic is if you people watch, and I would say, suggest you do this where, you know, you don't make it obvious uh, and you don't intrude on personal aspects, but something like a supermarket. If you, if you look at the supermarket tail cues, there is often examples of the agitated and the nervous, perhaps more agitated. You know, perhaps you've got somebody in the front who's paying with vouchers and taking their time perhaps they've had the call for a price from something to come back and you've got somebody else who's just desperate to get out and what you see are little clues that indicate the agitation so think about that you know they might be checking the watch the <sighs> avoiding eye contact that kind of thing just looking around and sometimes trying to win allies perhaps even looking at the, the person behind them in the queue to try and catch their eye to go you know and and, and connect because one of the things we do look like to look for in situations where perhaps our behavior is becoming less socially acceptable or allies people who will endorse our behavior and that's particularly important to spot earlier in the stage of agitation because that's when if they get that endorsement it can scale up to potentially the allowing the anger and the upset to 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 erupt now when we're talking about this we're talking about you know tears tantrums we're talking about that obvious perhaps flushing of the face or going very pale perhaps tightening of fists and uh, not necessarily like that but tighten the fists maybe down by the, the 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 sides perhaps you might see this in a meeting where somebody goes very quiet and very still and very fixed in their their face perhaps even sitting on the hands or even that kind of impression they're just sitting and containing themselves so anger doesn't necessarily need to be overtly displayed as in raised voices and we've all seen that kind of thing but it could be very contained and perhaps that's something to be aware of in the sense that that just because it's contained doesn't mean it doesn't need some sort of release safe diffusing and release it needs that kind of a pro attention and then we've got at the other end distressed and overwhelmed and again i guess we've experienced that or seen that where if somebody is no longer able to contain that anger or it's moved into real significant distress and overwhelm and even aggression perhaps at that end if we're talking about that and that's where perhaps avoidance is appropriate but distress and overwhelm where somebody is really not able to to rein it back in very quickly to bring themselves under control quickly and at that point diffusing is about supporting and then get creating safe space for somebody just to allow themselves to safely uh, maintain their dignity and bring themselves back down so in that respect, what I want to do is also just build in an understanding of how 
this escalation can reach a peak and then tail back off again because this is as i've no doubt you've experienced or seen this is something that can happen so quickly particularly if somebody's intoxicated or perhaps in a very distressed state we can find it in up and down very quickly so we need to be aware that there is no set profile if you like for escalation and de-escalation however there are a couple of classics that we just need to be aware of so um, i want to introduce you to this the graph which illustrates the phases of escalation here and if you think about on one side we've got the arousal level and what we mean by that is the levels of stress and alertness and arousal into agitation etc so it's low to high and then we've got time and time is obviously it's not fixed uh, in terms of it could be a few minutes, it could be seconds, but it's, we're talking about how quickly, to see how quickly things can escalate. So in that first sense, we've got kind of potentially that lower, slower level of escalation. That might be in the early stage where somebody's calm, but we start to see that the early signs of agitation. That can be a slow build. Somebody might, in a meeting, for example, be sitting just quietly starting to, something said, and it may take a few minutes for it to just start to bubble through, filter through, hang on, and we kind of can almost see the cogs working and the agitation build. That can take a little bit of time. But often what can happen is we just need then a trigger, something that then can lead to that critically fast escalation. So when somebody's in agitated state, and this could be in a, a calm state, but often once agitated, the adrenaline is starting to go around the system, we're almost ready there, it just can take one thing. So it might be another word from that person that said the thing that annoyed them in the first place that said, right, and suddenly we're escalating up into that crisis phase. And that crisis phase, when we're talking crisis, we're talking about on the other scale, that uh, overwhelm, that distress, or even the aggression versus potentially violence. And as I said, we'll, we'll kind of step away from that. But that crisis phase is where the individual is at peak emotion, low rational, and in a place where they are responding and reacting emotionally rather than actually proactively considering things. And this is where we need to factor that in because this is the point that the trigger phase and that peak there is where we need to think about avoidance, possibly, but principally diffusing. And what we need to realise is that that peak takes a little while to drop back down. If you've ever been in that state, it can take a little while just for things to kind of, for you to reach the peak and to start to come down and recovery starts. Key point here is that it is very easy to re-escalate at this point because in fact you're still, even though you may be coming down, you're still in a state of high stress, high emotion and it may take one small trigger, the wrong thing, the wrong place, a thought that occurs to them for somebody to, to, to head back up to their peak crisis phase. So we need to tread very carefully there. So this is a key point about diffusing. When we're trying to diffuse a situation, give people space, we need to allow enough time for people not only to come down, but to move well out of that phase, that post-crisis phase where the, the surge chemicals, stress chemicals drop right off. Now you'll see from the graph that actually what happens is they often after a crisis, people will dip right under their former calm state. And what this can mean is, this is really important as a leader to recognize this because people can become excessively passive or ultra compliant now as a leader you might think oh great i can get them to back on track and get them to do what they want but this is where you may get false compliance or you may get somebody being passive and later regretting or re, you know rescinding or coming back from what they've agreed to do at that time so as a leader we need to recognize that somebody may feel as if they're in a rational state but they're extra malleable and perhaps even manipulated, manipulatable, not even sure that that's a word. But the point is at that point, as a leader, perhaps we're still managing the diffusing and we're not trying to get the resolution. Resolution comes after that when the person res returns to calm and perhaps has had enough time to just get back a sense of energy, reflection and thought so that they can still stand up for themselves in a sense. They're not that malleable, but they're in a place where if we kind of manage this constructively, they're less likely to be triggered. So it's really important to recognise this in that whole process of managing this. We're talking diffusing is the name of the game here, not resolution. So I guess another 60 second thought capture here. What could you do to diffuse an emotionally tense or volatile situation? I'm confident that you will have some ideas and I've got some tips to come, but I am confident that you will have your own ideas and experience on this and you will know what works for you. So take 60 seconds out, uh, I'll start the clock, jot some thoughts down and then we'll revisit after that.
Okay, so I'm sure you've got one or two things in there, if not a lot, and you you know feel free to pause the video if you need a bit longer. Um, but I'm going to give you some tips, some thoughts, and I'm sure you'll have got some of these because it's not rocket science. Um, it's just how when we apply them and remembering to apply these, particularly if you as the as a leader might have been yourself in a highly in an agitated state because of the situation. So the first thing is to think about a risk assessment. Now, when I'm talking about that 10 second risk assessment, that sounds like, whoa, let's. What I'm talking about is taking a few seconds to let your, your instinctive stress response, your threat detection mechanisms, which we've all evolved, just absorb the, the data in the air, the signals and the, the, the environment and the atmosphere. And what I mean really is just pause for 10 seconds and just absorb perhaps make some trivial conversation like so how we're doing now how's things what you know just generally kind of doing that but at the same time what we're doing is we're just allowing our spidey senses i call them the little hairs on the back of your neck to kind of say yeah still maybe the atmosphere we could still cut this with a knife um yeah they're still they might be in that poor state they're a bit low or they're perhaps there's a risk of triggering again trust your instincts because sometimes we can bull on through when something is telling us now this is not the right time for this second thing is allow them to vent again i'm talking about not putting yourself in danger or subject uh, subjecting yourself to unacceptable behavior so when you need to decide what the tolerance level is for yourself but also in accordance with the behavior and respect standards that are pretty well articulated within the university environment but allowing somebody to vent is that acknowledgement that you know what sometimes we all get to a place where we're so and we just need to go and kind of just verbally vomit on somebody preferably willing participant in that but we kind of just need to get it out and that can really help with the deflation the bringing us out of the crisis mode or even heading it off to bring us back down manage yourself now this is where I'm going to explore this more in other videos, so you might want to check that out um, in terms of uh, some of the other self-teach videos where I explore this manage yourself and stay calm uh, in a little more detail. But we're talking about staying composed. And what do I mean by that? That is just slowing things down, just kind of gathering your own thoughts, taking a breath. I often talk about, and I will talk about in the stress sessions, the sessions in resilience where I talk about the rescue breath. Breathing is a powerful tool in the kit, and I do expand on that in the um, those sessions. But for you, if you are just wanting to compose yourself, taking a nice, slow, long breath can be really, really powerful. Pausing in silence that comes with breathing can be really impactful in a, in a situation like this. So I often talk, tell people to just breathe in for a count of two, hold your breath for a count of two, breathe out for four. And that nice, slow process is just a way of gaining that composure back and assertiveness being assertive i do explore that along with the calm this whole calm thing in the conflict resolution uh, module where i talk about challenging inappropriate behavior sticking up and speaking up for yourself so i will expand on that in that module so check that out but assertiveness is balancing it's not being aggressive and dismissing their needs and overriding them with yours it's not being passive where you allow their needs to override your own it's about that balance between where mutual our agendas are both respected but we are trying to find a way forward and that's where that negotiation that win-win comes from but i do expand on that in a little bit more looking confident now looking confident even if you don't feel it can be really powerful and it can actually have a, a feedback mechanism for yourself as well so things like that breathing technique that's straightening up if you're sitting down just straightening up lifting the chin not like up like that but just lifting it straight dropping the shoulders a bit just breathe it out and and just having that confident posture and confident hand gestures as well so not not kind of timid you know like kind of hands in front of you covering this kind of thing sh shrinking away kind of just open up a little bit and have some confident gestures you know not pointed because that's more aggressive but like so have we and kind of think about what works for you and a measured tone it's just that nice slowing piercing things down Actively listen, do a module on listening, but it's important to just be present and be in the room and listen and take that time to absorb rather than spend it distracted thinking about what else you've got to do, doing something else or thinking about, right, well, I'll say this in a minute. Don't rehearse your response before you've actually listened. Using open body language, as I said, it's kind of not, not like kind of clenchy, pointy, arms like this is kind of just nice open something that indicates you know i'm open here i'm willing to learn to talk non-threatening that kind of thing 
apologize. And again, I don't mean apologize if it's not your fault, but an apology, if generally there's something to apologize for, can really, really be helpful. You know, I'm, I'm really sorry you've had to wait. Or I'm, I, I could see that I said the wrong thing. I'm really sorry for that. I had no intention. You know, that kind of thing can really help. Not straight away necessarily let somebody just vent and come down and give it genuinely because a fake apology doesn't cut it. Acknowledge their feelings and the LEAPS model, the listen, empathise, ask, paraphrase um, and uh, summarise are all really useful uh, approaches. And again, I talk about that in the, the listening uh, self-teach module. Research, rehearse your responses. Now, this is an interesting one. Again, I developed this in the um, assertiveness, the, the module around conflict resolution and that include assertiveness in this. But sometimes it's useful to have some stock phrases where if somebody's disagreeing, rather than saying, don't agree with you, shut up, this is what I think, we kind of say, I'm not sure I see it that way. Tell me more, tell me, explain to me what you are thinking or what's behind those thoughts. Because that then puts the onus back on them to explain, but it gives you a chance to have a stock phrase, if you like, that you can tailor for the situation. And that can be really useful. It gets them thinking a little bit deeper and it gets you something that you can actually engaging which is less confrontational know your environment i think that's really important just to pick the environment especially if you're trying to resolve something is it private is it somewhere where there isn't that audience there isn't that risk of disruption disruption or distraction or a feeling of breaching confidentiality somebody listening in that kind of thing somewhere where both one or both of you can feel safe to exit quite easily and allow them to save face. I mean, this is a really interesting and important one, actually. Um, I mentioned about the audience, but how often is it that sometimes we can build ourselves up and we can uh, and we can give somebody what we think, you know, tell them what it like it is, and perhaps when we come down, we start to realize maybe I was a bit over the top. But if we're still faced with confrontation or judgment or that even um, patronizing approach, the backing down thing is less likely to happen. I'm not likely to admit I was wrong or to say, okay, let's be reasonable if you are in judgmental or confrontational mode. So it's about as a leader allowing that space, being backing off with any kind of a, the, the the confrontational approach and allowing them a space to to just diffuse and accept that they may have been wrong or a little bit over the top or this, that and the other. And also maybe to give them some points that they, that you both agree on. Ah, yeah, I see where you come from. I get you on that one. So allowing them to have something, and this is not manipulative, it's important because this is how negotiation works. Saving fear, saving, um, allowing us to have that two-way process is really, really important. So those are some basic tips, but what I want to do is kind of talk about a, a navigation tool. And if you did the bite-sized video um, around this, the Kudsa model is what I'm going to introduce. You'll, you'll may well be familiar with this. But one of the things I find in conversations that, that can you know get into the weeds with discussion, disagreement, debate, all sorts of issues, emotional this, who did what, they did this, I'm upset about that. It can get all over the place and we can start to lose track of where, you know, where we're going with this. So I really like what I I suppose I phrase is conversation navigation tools. And the Kudsa is a great tool for trying to resolve and navigate our way through a disagreement or a complaint or a something, conflict to a, a, a resolution that's, if not totally win-win, we can at least agree there's some action we can take forward and we can at least have agree to disagree, for example. Now, Kudsa, as I said before, is a resolution model. It's not a diffusing model. So if we're talking about diffusing something, we need to diffuse, then resolve at the right time. So this Kudsa model is a useful approach to that. So Kudsa stands for, obviously, five things. The first thing is confront. This gets to the heart of that continuum where at one end avoid, the other end resolve. Avoiding conflict, avoiding disagreement, avoiding issues between team members that you know really that's just going to fester is not a medium or a long-term strategy or even a short-term strategy. It may be necessary in the moment if, if there are physical safety reasons, but on the whole, we need to confront. And we need to confront constructively, assertively, balancing respect and dignity and those kinds of things. But we do need to confront it. And in confronting it, that's the sit down, let's talk about this, let's open up the conversation. We then need to you, which is understand. And that's when we slow things down. And you as the mediator, perhaps a one on one or one to two, listen, actively listen, question, 
the what the you know the 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 what the where the the who the when um, and what were the reasons behind that kind of thing let's get some real good questions in there and get some information out get them talking and get them let's get exploring let's get some material to work with then as we feel like and we don't rush that process we feel like we're starting to get to a point where we can d define the issue define it this is really important because if we don't clarify and verbalize our defining of the problem we could be working on solving the wrong problem or in our sense the problem we see or the issue or the complaint but they see it as something different and as a former police officer managing complaints sometimes when i've been um, uh, you know managing a complaint from a member of the public about a police officer's actions one of the things that's really important to do is get clear about what is it they're specifically not happy with because i could hear all this un through the understanding process lots of information but come to a conclusion that actually what they haven't done is they haven't investigated it thoroughly, for example. So if I don't define that, I will start solu seeking solutions around that. Or if I define that, it gives the other person the opportunity to think, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's what they haven't done. Or actually, no, no, I get that they might not have done that. But what I'm really bothered about is that they were quite dismissive and they didn't. They, they came and they didn't want to be there. They were out in 30 seconds. It felt like they, I've just felt like a number. Now, they're two different problems. Yes, as a police officer, I want that person to investigate better, but I need to resolve what the pro this issue that they defined, that we have agreed. So the defining it allows us to come to, is this the issue? Let's agree, let's define it. Okay, right. Then we can move on to the S, which is searching for solutions. The searching for solutions is an important part as well, and it's collaborative wherever possible. This is where we are at the resolve the negotiation, not the power area of this because power might be where you say right this is what we're going to do blah 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 as i said that's not ideal we're trying to get solutions onto the table from both parties and the reason we do that is because they may have some great ideas to solve it that are just dead easy to do that all that you would never think of but also they may have some unreasonable expectations and in order to manage those unreasonable expectations, we need them to tell us. We need them to say, well, I want this, I would like that, I need this, so that we can get it out and say, right, okay, well, here's some ideas for me. Let's have a look. What have we got? That one, yeah, I get why you want that, but we don't have the budget for that, for example, or I don't have the resources, etc. How about what, what, what have we got on the rest of the table here? And that's where we can then move to this agreement process and ultimately agree action agree a way forward we may agree to disagree we may still have a different viewpoint that's okay we're not about twisting arms here but in agreeing to disagree we can still potentially agree some actions to move forward so how can we resolve this okay so i, I get what you're saying i don't quite see it that way i get you see it this way what we do need to do is move forward so how about I do this and what are your thoughts on doing that and let's agree some concrete actions and with agree the key thing is follow up do them complete them otherwise the whole process falls into disrepute and with agree it's also important to follow up to check in later because again motivation to resolve the problem is high at this moment but in a week's time it may dwindle, uh, dwindle. and if it dwindles we may take our eye off the ball and the problem doesn't get truly resolved and it flares up again later. So we really need to think about checking in and making sure that you and they do the actions and understand what's happened and what progress has been made. So I guess the key question is how could they support you during a challenging conversation? Um, and I think that's important to just think about those situations where you could use that tool both for preparing and also navigating through the conversation. A couple of little tips, just some thoughts on how do we how we could use Kudsa as a tool. One to one is perhaps a little bit more straightforward. These are not easy, but a little bit more straightforward than when you're trying to mediate between different parties. And I'll come back to that shortly. But if you imagine we have the environment and the setting, and that's important, as I said before, to think about what's the right environment here. I've kind of just put a circle on the image here. It doesn't have to be a room. It could be a, a, a coffee area, for example. We do need to consider confidentiality, but you may be more comfortable both parties being somewhere public. So there's a feeling of safety because you're in the public. So it's not about having it in a boxed off room. But either way, we need some safe space to escape. And by escape, I don't want to dramatise this. I just mean to feel like, yeah, I can leave at any time. I'm not compelled to be here. There's you, there's them. And what we need is we do want to avoid confrontation. So you'll see on the image that they're kind of angled away. Now, this is practical kind of body language and positioning. But what we need to do is not sit face to face 
right let's sort this out and we're talking straight into each other that's not going to work it's going to be confrontational but if we just open the arc out a bit what it gives us is an arc of overlap where we can co connect but also space around us where if we feel things are getting intense there is there is a wider space we can either move to or just sit back and take in really really important to feel that particularly if if we're talking about important topics that are perhaps provoking emotions because our sense of space need for space personal space increases as our emotional level our agitation increases okay so one to two now what i would say is you are not this is not about training you to be an official mediator or a qualified professional mediator this is just to give you an idea of how some mediation skills and tools can be useful in your day-to-day -day leadership role so what I would say is, if you are trying to manage a disagreement or a, a something, a complaint or an issue between two people, firstly, just consider the level that it's at, because we're talking about where are you at with your skill level and what's appropriate. If somebody has been um, rude or offensive to somebody else, that we will talk about challenging behaviour in, in the um, conflict resolution module, it may be that it falls into the respect and behaviour standards within your the the club or the association and the university so we need to think about that you may want to take some advice we may need to take this outside of it so i don't want you to think that you have to take this on your shoulders but a couple of tips just if you're thinking yeah this is this is something i do want to i think i can handle it's really pretty low level you've intervened quite early there's been a bit of a disagreement then we need to think about how do i do this so let's let's assume that what we're not going to do is get the two parties in straight away with you there. What we need to do as a manager, a leader, is to firstly get clear about the issues. So we do a kudsa intervention on each person separately. We have a conversation outside of it and we establish that. And part of the A, the agreeing the actions, will be to seek, well, to decide where is it appropriate that we can bring it together, but also to seek agreement because we're not going to force people together. We don't do the knocking of the heads together thing anymore. <laughs> so it's about how, right, okay, so we agreed. Are you totally comfortable? Are you okay with this? Let's do this. And I'll manage this and, and kind of support you in this. And then if we look at this, when we bring the two people together, we need to apply the same principles. Not somewhere where they're compelled to be, where they're somewhere where they can feel they're okay to leave, they feel a space, and they're not confronting each other face to face. And perhaps we're working at an angle so they've got that kind of arc of connection but the ability to see wider and to move away and we can apply the kutsa in the in that group setting so let's just talk through let's get each other's position on this how, how, do, how do you feel there's no rules what i would say is let's give each other an airing let's avoid personal like personalizing it uh, and let's move on with that so what i would say in terms of tips are risk assess it as I said before, if it's if it's low level and you feel it's safe and, you know, even if emotions get a little bit high, it's completely low level and safe and you can manage it, then fine. But just be very wary. These things can get out of hand quickly. Set the ground rules. It's really important before you move them in together, but also remind when you're in together is to discuss, right, it's OK too and it's not OK too. So, you know, don't get personal. Stick to something that's been done or said. Don't personalise it. Don't talk about them as you are this, you are that. Don't label. And if somebody is like that, I'll kind of remind you of that. Give each other space. Let's not raise point fingers, raise voices. Let's slow things down. So we start to set a few ground rules. Slow things down. Take breaks if needed because we just need to space this out and respect at all times, obviously. And this is where you need to obviously have a clear understanding of what is acceptable, what's not, and how we should treat each other. And just a reminder, and preferably lower level reminders early on rather than letting the you know somebody escalate into saying things that they will regret, never mind anything else. So that avoiding personalization is important. And ultimately, remember, we might agree to disagree. But what we're looking for is a work in progress forward. So, OK, look, I can see that maybe we don't, we're not going to resolve that. And that's fine. You both entitle your opinions. Um, what, are, what can we do to move things forward? How are we going to work together? What practical things can we do to, to move this forward? And if it's at low level, often people can do that. And it's about seeking solutions collaborative, isn't it? Isn't it? So what can we do together? Not imposing as the mediator. That's not your role in this particular situation. As I said, seek advice if you're so unsure or you just feel you need that kind of support before embarking on it. Or if you feel it's just running away with you at any given stage, stop the procedure, stop the process and kind of take that support and advice. So what now? 
what I want to kind of just encourage you to do is to, if you haven't already, download the PDF workbook, start to do a big exercise, revisit the content and refresh and think about how you'll apply it in your own leadership role. Complete those session, post session activities um, and even the, the case study exercise, which is a good way to safely think about, well, what would I do in this situation? And then consider attending the Q&A sessions in person or in, online. Okay, so we've covered understanding of conflict and we did talk about the idea that it can move from artificial harmony through to constructive to destructive to personal attack how do we how do emotions play into that it's really important to understand that and how we can manage the volatility of emotions and bring it down so that once we've diffused using the tips that we suggested we can then look at resolving and that's where the kutzer model can come in and then some general tips around mediation using the kutzer model and, and ideas now hopefully that's been useful for you hopefully there will be some ideas and some thoughts about how you can apply this my my general suggestion is a practice with more safe situations until you get your confidence and experience up there always seek advice and drop into the q a sessions if you want to uh, develop or, or ask any particular meaty questions that would be really useful and for now thank you very much for your time i hope that's been really valuable for yourself um, and take care